How do you transition from your corporate gig to an entrepreneurial gig? Welcome to the Red to Black podcast with your host Warner and Mario. And today we have a special guest, Johnson Riggs, a professional services at SAP, focuses on technology and sales. Johnson, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Johnson Briggs. Uh, thrilled to be here. Yeah, I am a client partner at SAP, which means I'm accountable for professional services and standing up enterprise technology. Um, yeah, I've got an MBA from Temple that's uh, helped me achieve this position and uh, a whole lot of lesson learned. So hopefully this podcast will function as uh, you know part professional advice and part cautionary tale. Pleasure to be on, guys, really. Thanks. It's a pleasure to have you on. So I'll, I'll try to frame this com conversation about, you know, your late 20s, early 30s, you deciding you were going to pivot in a different direction, getting in, getting some professional training, making a network, and then pivot into corporate America. Can you kind of walk us through those those building blocks that landed you at SAP? Yeah. So um, I'm going to try not to monologue too much, but uh, I was working – um, okay, I'm going to monologue a little bit. Let me back Go up. Hit it. Yeah. So, um, 2008, I graduate from college with a philosophy degree and I'm planning on going to law school. Um, and then I audit some law school classes. Um, I fell asleep in one of them, which I'd never done in my entire academic career. And I was just like, oh boy. So I was in, uh, Reno, Nevada with, uh, this, you know, full, kind of worthless philosophy degree, really, um, even though I, I still value it. I came back to valuing it, but um, working at a comedy club, working at a minor league ballpark, um, you know, got arrested for some dumb stuff um, and found myself moving to Houston, Texas in 2009 and starting an entry level customer service job for an energy services company. Um, they said, hey, this guy's not exactly a dummy and he seems to have some energy. So went out into sales. I did that for about five years and it was fun until it wasn't anymore. I took inventory of uh, you know, my skills. I read a really great book uh, and I've got a list of reading recommendations for your viewers at the end of this. Um, it's called The Second Machine Age and uh, two MIT guys basically about you know, the pending age of automation. Um, boy, that was 10 years ago. Um, so it inspired me to, you know, look at myself and be like, okay, um, you know, who am I and what can I do with my life? And also how can I make a little bit more money? Um, so I studied really hard for the, um, the GMAT. I did okay. Um, and I got into Temple University um, and uh, achieved an MBA full-time program. So uh, one of the things I think I'll, I'll come back to is, you know, based on where I was living at the time, which is Philadelphia with my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, making not a lot of money, uh, I made kind of a risky decision to buy a network, uh, which is what you're doing when you go into any sort of educational debt. Uh, I'll, I'll pause there and do kind of a pulse check for questions, understanding Okay, so Temple is in downtown Philadelphia, is that correct? Uh, I wish it was in downtown Philadelphia. It okay. is in North Philly, uh, which is North a rough Philly. neighborhood. Yeah, uh, very nice campus though, and um, you know, a, a pretty good institution. Um, although, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share some some more details about uh, the nuances of the program as they come up. I'll just say that um, you bring up an interesting point that you bought a network, and I would just I would just caution the viewers that there's two ways of building networks. There's uh, writing huge checks, and there's suffering together, and they both they're both they both have a certain amount of pain to them. Writing a huge check or going into student debt is one way to get a network. The other way, I think your brother is familiar with this. You're probably intimately familiar with this. Is to go suffer with some lads. Uh, preferably over in a third world country, and you will build, you will, you will fortify relationships. You will build relationships. You'll strengthen relationships, and you probably have some lifelong friends and, and, a, and a decent network. Would you uh, echo that? That's absolutely right. So um, there's a direct analog to the, the military there, right? Um, you know, I know, know you folks. You're, you both are officers, correct? Something right. like that, both, maybe, both. maybe something. Like well, that's fine. That's fine, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you work with some enlisted guys and, um, you know, that some, some of them might have joined at 18, 19 without a lot of options. But, 
you know, knew that um, they loved their country, they wanted to do something physical and exciting, right? Which is what the advertisements say. Um, and yeah, they're borrowing some institutional credibility to and, and the wealth of America writ large to build themselves up. Um, you know, not everybody necessarily succeeds at that, but dude, same with uh, college or graduate school. You know, people will go there and just say, okay, um, sign up, gain entrance, question mark, profit, right? We all know the meme and uh, they don't take the necessary steps of actually learning anything or, you know, building themselves up in the interim. So I just have to gain access and then, then it, things will work out and that's not really how things work out. Yeah. So that's a great point because where this podcast sort of goes is the ultimate thing, which is what's your return on best of capital, because that's what creates financial freedom. So talk a little bit more about the MBA and your decision, because when you buy a network, like you said, just because you buy the network doesn't mean you're going to be getting a return on invested capital. It depends on the network you're buying and it depends on what that network is going to gain you in terms of making more revenue. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, boy, I'm glad I prepared for this, right? But uh, here's, um, I, I ended up with a, a pretty good ROI and, and payback period for my M MBA. Um, I couldn't even spell ROI back in you know 2015 um i took my first finance class and i was like oh damn what did i get myself into right um you know the the expense of school even for an institution like temple which is kind of middle of the pack but climbing at the time significant um so one thing i'll, I'll stake out is um you know for, for military folks um the roi of an advanced degree um, provided, you know, you uh, put that middle step of getting something out of it personally, uh, that ROI is undefined, right? Um, the post 9-11 GI Bill is such a ridiculously good deal, uh, provided you're serious about it, get into a good program. I have a, a buddy who was in the Marine Corps uh, UAV program in, in Hawaii, uh, and his side hustle was to uh, get a comp sci degree. He also, you know, studied his ass off for, for the GMAT, which is the graduate management aptitude test and got a very respectable score, you know, 88th percentile or something. Uh, but then he also got an offer to work for Microsoft uh, with those autistic people at the NSA. Oh, sorry, fine, I don't want to tear fine. anybody down. But MBA, not worth it to it, uh, to him because he's got three small kids, a great offer from Microsoft, and you know can pass along that post 9-11 GI scholarship to his kids. Um, the cool thing about the GMAT, if there are folks on the, on the listeners list, um, you know, it's valid for five years, your GMAT score. Um, so uh, a guy like this, you know, my, my, my buddy, um, if Microsoft sponsors his executive MBA, right, he's pretty much set to become a corporate one percenter, right? Um, so he, he did the legwork early. Um, so for myself, right, and, and for others who uh, are maybe not in the military um, or, you know, don't have a trust fund, um, expect to pay at least 80K out of pocket um, and likely way more if you're moving to a new city, uh, floating your own expenses. Uh, but at the same time, right, here's a stress test for the MBA. Um, so we had five Indian guys in the program. Shout out Ritam, Utkarsh, Amin, Ankit, and Karan. Uh, these guys paid full price, sticker price tuition, 100K a pop, uh, moved from all parts of India. Those loans were mandatorily underwritten by the Indian government, and they're paying 10% interest on them. Um, but this is still a good deal for them because you compare their wages in India versus in the West, um, and they were still making like four to five times less than somebody in a comparable position, you know, working uh, at Accenture. Um, so uh, a swag, and, and swag guys is scientific wild ass guess, um, you know, they're just now reaching their break even point with all their individual careers. I, I checked in on them um, and um, they're all still working in the West. And uh, one of them even married an American girl. So. 
you know, talk about a come up, right? Um, so that their uh, their break even point, um, their their ROI is also great, and it's not just financial. Um, that they're doing it right. They're living the the American dream, or in, in the case of two of them, the Canadian dream. But still, it's you know really cool for them, and it's what they wanted to do. They went after it and got it. So, how long did it take them to get to that break even point? Because for our listeners what we always talk about is when you invest in a business you say you take $100,000 and you put it in a business and you buy it you know do Warren Buffett or Howard Marks style where you buy that business and that dividend say paying you 10% that's going to take you 10 years to get back that break even point right so how long does it take them to get that break even point and then using that initial $100,000 investment when they've paid it off what's the percentage return on that on that hundred thousand dollars after they've passed the break even point. Well, I would basically say um, there's there's a really good MBA ROI calculator um, on uh, MBA MBA.com. Um, so I would direct listeners there um, to to do some of the math. Uh, they're they're basically at zero right now in terms of lost wages, but then everything else is gravy. Uh, on a percentage basis, Warner, I, I couldn't really tell you, right? I don't know exactly what their their salaries are. Um, you know, I'm, even though I'm at the uh, well past my own break even point in terms of um, earnings, right? I am still servicing a little bit of debt, um, but at the same time, I was also able to knock out my wife's higher interest debt. Um, on account of you know performance in my role post MBA, which you know no MBA, no SAP, um, and my wife would likely still be teaching and not be home with our kids, right? So I would say that um, when when you go into debt, you have to consider the broader value equation and not just always the pure percentage stuff, um, which I know is not exactly the answer you're looking for. No, I, I get it. There's other there's other intangibles like the the network, the relationships you've built, and the 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 future payment that will go up. What Mario and I for guys coming in, we want them to really break it down to the numbers because then that gives them these targets to hit. Because the quicker you can get yourself out of debt, or say I'm going to forego an MBA and just say become a plumber or a tradesman. And then build that return on your invested capital, whether it's your labor or money you're putting in your gear. And the quicker you can get to generating cash flow, that's the goal for this this podcast channel. How do you, in the quickest amount of time, get to position where you have little to no debt and you're generating cash flow? That's why that's why we're asking. So um, let me respond to that with an illustration, right? And I actually wrote down these these figures, right? Twenty seventeen. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Riggs had a 230k mortgage on a cruddy house in Philly, uh, $170,000 in combined student debt, uh, two two crappy cars, and no kids. Um, in 2021, uh, we have a 400k mortgage on a nice house in the Burbs, um, $38,000 in student loan combined, uh, two average cars, two above average kids, and double the net worth. Again, I got. I got pretty lucky, right? Um, so um, I guess I can tell you kind of the story of my MBA, right? So I got into this program. I established myself as kind of the go-to public speaker um, and kind of contrarian in the program. But, you know, the learning curve for me was was hard with the finance and technology skills. Uh, I, I try to be a lifelong learner, but, you know, as you guys know, I, I haven't even mastered timekeeping yet um <laughs> well, Mario and i've been hammered time. many a time on timekeeping um, yeah. <laughs> um okay <That's> good. <laughs> um but yeah i mean the, the nba right there's some skills that are were unnatural for me to learn but you know if you immerse yourself you get some osmosis you meet people who are better at some of those skills apply teamwork right um but yeah, I would say on the whole for something like that, especially, you know, being the, the Billy Madison of the group, right? A little bit older than average uh, folks who were doing a full-time MBA. It was tough to maintain that 
growth mindset based on some of the things I already knew about the business and working world and also, you know, some of the way the content was delivered. Um, one of the things that is highlighted in the MBA program um, is, you know, you have to get a summer internship. Um, the one I got was a marketing gig for Crayola and it just it just wasn't a good fit, right? And consumer package good wasn't my wasn't my passion. So, you know, Easton PA is where um, Crayola is is located. I'm making thirty bucks an hour, um, not loving the job. I was away from my wife because uh, it's two hours away from Philadelphia. Um, so yeah, just kind of you know going through that internship, feeling sorry for myself. Um, but again, the networks, right? The network that I bought. I have a, a classmate who her internship wasn't working out at SAP. She posted on our, our Facebook group when I was still on Facebook. So shout out Facebook for the last time it was uh, useful to me. Um, you know, she said, hey, I'm giving up this internship. Anybody else want it? And uh, I jumped on it just because it was in the technology world. And I knew that SAP was a blue chip company. <laughs> I worked for a very challenging German company and it was again, just like, man, am I not cut out for the corporate world? Uh, but then based on, you know, my skills inventory, which included being the kind of go-to pitch man in the MBA, I discovered that SAP uh, had a program called the Academy for Sales. The Academy for Sales is sort of like the IBM uh, summit program, um, you know, <laughs> uh, it, really cool. Um, I would say a lot of the coursework was somewhat redundant to the MBA, uh, but that that was a good thing, right? You get a chance to further sharpen the saw. Um, but yeah, um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I don't mean to drone on, fellas. Yeah. No, you're doing you're doing well. No, you're doing you're doing well. I think we're I think we're just trying to get, we're trying to understand what led you to SAP, how you got there, and 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 kind of let's kind of transition a little bit to where you're going. So you've landed, you've you've got an MBA under your belt, you got a network, you landed a good internship at a, at a fa fantastic German company, you got into an excellent sales program, you learned some skills, you developed some skills, you as you said, you sharpened your saw, and now what's next? What's the next pivot for you? How much longer are you going to work in corporate America, and then when are you going to start your own business? Yeah, so. Um... Great, great questions. One of the things that I do have to, um, sh you know, shout out for the, the, the program is, um, you know, the, the interview process was quite weird for the sales academy. Um, it's basically a competitive case-based co-opetition. They throw you in a room with uh, four other applicants and say, here's the problem. Uh, you're pitching to a client at the end of the day work together to solve it, right? Oh, by the way, only you know one or two of you is going to get hired out of this group. Um, and to even get there, I think it was like, you know, one in a thousand applicants, right? So really helped having, already having that SAP internship as a foot in the door, even though I was a crappy intern, right? I wasn't built for the operations job that they hired me for and kind of knew it, but, you know, made, made other relationships. Um, so um, anyway, I, th the first thing I wanted to express there is gratitude for how lucky I, <laughs> I was uh, getting to that stage. And then, you know, I got this full-time job offer from SAP the day before I graduated from my MBA program. Uh, then I got married a month later. Um, so all these kind of good things happened all at once. Um, and then, you know, really started in the role, um, I guess, let's see, June 2018, right? That's when I picked up a quota. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'm aligned to utilities. Um, which is analogous to my previous experience, right? Working in a energy services business. Um, you know, I, I really think it's a great place to be. Um, automation of what we call the meter to cash process, um, trying to get utilities to move to the cloud, which uh, is interesting, right? Because utilities have a strong, strong incentive in the United States to capitalize all their expenditures. Um, and there's a 
you know, a variety of weird legacy reasons for that. Um, but, you know, they don't want money in OPEX and cloud is considered OPEX. So now it's a matter of their accountants uh, updating their own rules to be able to capitalize cloud. And uh, if they bought the actual servers and ran it as a on-site service, maybe SAP backed them up with the software, backed them up with support. Would that be, uh, would that be, capital capex or would that be uh as you said capital as operations expense yeah it it, it so, sometimes it doesn't matter about the asset because let's back up right the cloud is just yesterday's software on somebody else's computer right um so what you're doing is just renting the asset right um and uh utilities specifically if, uh are concerned about you know security issues and things like that right um so they've had on-prem mainframes there's a handful of utilities who basically you know have locally hosted cloud-like mainframes on a platform we call hana enterprise cloud um because i'm in professional services um and you know uh, my scope touches kind of all our products i have to be um uh, uh, inch deep and a mile wide. Um, so can't really get too deep into the cloud CapEx discussion, uh, but there's cr creative ways around it. And we have customers in the utilities field who basically the, their accountants are getting with the times, I would say, right? It's, it's all accounting rules and, um, you know, applying for, um, it's called a rate case, right? You basically tell uh, a regulatory committee, you know, how much uh, energy you're going to produce, how much you think rate payers should pay, and then that gets locked in for a set period of time. And based on that, you're allowed to, you know, keep your utilities infrastructure running and <laughs> gild your utility sometimes, right? Which means paint it with gold. Uh, in the in the past, utilities have been accused of, um, you know, doing just that, capitalizing everything and spending a lot on skunk works that don't really go anywhere. So. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if um, any sort of free market emerges for, for utilities and energy. Uh, but that's also, it's kind of my mystery and, and frustration with it is where is all this stuff going? Yeah, so basically, you kind of took this path that you had really had no idea where you were going. And then it ended up the MBA kind of sort of focused you and helped you to develop these connections and then get in with this great company named SAP. And I would say the lesson learned from that is for guys coming out is to really maybe jump into some different industries and figure out what you like. Don't get into a lot of debt, figure out what you like, and then, then determine what your next steps are. If you can go to an MBA, really sit down like in that, that calculator and determine, hey, is the MBA the right route for me? I, I put in a hundred thousand. How long will it take for me to get that hundred thousand back? Right. You, you didn't necessarily do that, but you had some great outcomes coming out of that. But the lessons learned are kind of figure out what you would like to do. Another thing I heard was if you're a military guy, like Mario and I coming out, it depends on what type you are. If you're like a fed up military guy, like Mario, that's all we'll say coming out. We just want to do our own thing then we, we don't need the MBA. We're just going to go execute. But if you're an individual bridging the gap, which you talked about, an MBA with the GI Bill is, and we have friends that have done it, is a great gap because they're paying for that, that bill. Now it's just about picking the right business. That's going to have huge upside potential, and SAP is one of them. So I guess to, to further the conversation what Mario was saying, what are you? You're setting up. You're paying down your debt. You're getting your infrastructure and your house and your family set. Now, what are the next steps you're taking to transition to an entrepreneurial lifestyle? Yeah. So, um, one item I would say is cryptocurrency. Um, you know, I uh, I got involved in crypto back in in 2012. Um, I had uh, 20 Bitcoin. <laughs> that I spent. <laughs> um, so that was, that was kind of funny. Uh, and then I recently came back to it and, you know, the end of last year, I have a buddy who works for Ripple. Um, he said, Hey, you know, Ripple's this really great um, crypto. It's built on the Ethereum blockchain. I work there now, you know, you should check us out and consider investing. And um, 
I did, and the price um, went up by a thousand percent. Uh, and then they got sued by the SEC. Um, my assets are locked right now. Um, so it was just kind of like a gambling side bet. Um, and I looked at that and I was just like, well, wait a minute, right? You know, let's go back to this Bitcoin thing and started understanding a little bit more about, you know, central banking and um, economics and things like that. So that's kind of my, um, the asset portfolio that I want to hold for a little bit and uh, probably borrow against that um, to get some sort of small business loan in, in the future. Um, so that that's one strategy. Um, the the other is there's a lot of very interesting franchise opportunities out there. Um, one of the things that you know taking uh, a self inventory is you know I love um, hospitality, uh, entertainment, things like that. And um, if you filter for some of these things. There are some things that are, you know, non-restaurant franchises um, that are, are pretty interesting and compelling. And it's just, you know, you got to pay to play and same thing, sit down, crunch the numbers. Um, so I, I think that folks who are already listening to this, um, you know, probably are savvier than I was when I started my journey. Um, so good on you. And there's, man, does it ever just blow your mind, guys, about just the absolute uh, explosion of resources that are out there in terms of podcasts, and YouTube, and you know, free tools, all this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Warner and I are constantly talking about YouTube and our young nephews and being like, we had a fit. I mean, we're talking more than just business, but we're like, we're talking about relationships. We're talking about things that we had to, we had to learn. Like we had to go through the, the, the college of hard knocks. We had to learn it by, by like trial and error, like Friday nights, Friday nights, Saturday nights, trying to learn. We're like the amount of just, just Chris Voss, his negotiation, uh, which free, I mean, he gives away 99.99% of his knowledge for free on YouTube. If you just have the time, if you can, if you can carve out 30 minutes a day to, to, to watch the black swan podcast, I think that's what black swan group. Um, yeah, it's the Black Swan Group. We're just like both Warren and I are at, at, at just at, in awe of how much knowledge you can put in your brain from YouTube, like YouTube University. We joke around. We're like, nah, we don't, you know, we don't have an MBA, but we got into YouTube, YouTube University. So I was a voracious reader growing up, and and even uh, in different pursuits of my life. And I had an opportunity in the military to really be to, to basically have a very solid career where I was often alone and unafraid or alone and afraid in third world countries. And I had just an enormous amount of downtime to read. So I kind of got a secondary or third ed education by reading. Um, and Warner, Warner is the same way. He's a ferocious reader. He's constantly ordering more books than he can read or he can ever read. And then uh, the amount of I mean, literally, I've been in his house. This was years ago, but he had um, a library set up in his house. He had, to, he had to donate a bunch of books when he moved to Wyoming. But now it's all digital. Uh, yeah, the amount of the amount of there is no excuse. There is no excuse for improving your IQ. And people think I have a I've had several sergeant majors, first sergeants that will come to me and be like, I'm real dumb. And I'm like, stop, stop. And, and these guys took like a they took a they took an IQ test when they were 17 years old or 16 in high school or junior high school. It's like an ASVAB. It's a it's a type of and they scored like a an 86, which is six points away from being a retard. And then they, they're like 20 or 30 years later, they've, they've educated, they've expanded their mind. They're incredibly bright. I mean, they know, they know all sorts of things about advanced technologies with uh, satellite communications, and radios and operations, logistics, leadership. They're, I mean, they're really, really bright dudes. And they come to me saying, I have an 86 IQ. I'm, I'm like, no, no, maybe, maybe when you were smoking pot and, and, and drinking a keg of beer on a Friday night and trying to take a test on Monday morning, maybe you had an 86 IQ when you were 17 years old. And at 37 years old, you don't have an 86 IQ. So uh, your, current, your current position in life, folks, for, the, for the, my young nephews listening out there, you can improve. You can get smarter. You can get wiser. And there's really no excuse nowadays to not do that with free, with free education. Absolutely free. So that's my thoughts. Warner, anything to add? Oh, I was going to say along just to recreate what you were saying is about jumping that IQ when we're talking about business IQ. There's this trend going around nowadays called like quit your nine to five. And it's just like 
boom, blanket, just go do it. I think that's one of the most moronic decisions you can make because it doesn't take into account underlying cash flow. It's what Mario and I talk about. And, and Johnson's kind of pointing to it. If, you, if, you're, if you've been listening to this podcast and you're not smoking pot, drinking a keg of beer, and you're actually focused on our podcast, <laughs> then you would be hearing that Johnson was taking certain steps. He was in this discovery phase in Reno where it was just like, okay, this isn't working. Jail, no, that's not going to work. Then he went down to Houston, found this, this sales environment, like, oh, I kind of like that. Then he's like, well, I got to jump up in life. Well, what's one way to do that? Do an MBA. He found out about uh, Crayola Crayons, SAP. And, but what he, started, what he started formulating, whether you know it or not, Johnson, in your mindset, you were, you're formulating these steps. You're like, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. And you said pay to play. I would say pay for performance or pay for a system or pay for – uh, and like a packaged business that's been given to you with an already proven operating system, which perf- which franchises are known for doing. That's why they're more successful than a regular startup. And you're following this path where you're saying, I'm not just going to jump into it. I'm going to step down. And it's smart because you're like, my goal is cash flow. I'm going to step into a franchise possibly that's going to, that's proven that I can create revenue. It's got proven systems. And then from there, once you've done the franchise, then you could jump into like something from the ground up. But if you say, I'm going to go from nine to five and I'm going to go straight into doing a startup, I know because I've been doing it for 10 years, the chances are really 90% that you're going to fail. And we don't want that for our listeners when the goal is to create financial freedom. So going to you, Johnson, what, what were you going to say about what Mario just said? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the people who say just, you know, quit your job, follow your dream. Um, they haven't really reflected much on what, what dreams are, <laughs> what reality is. Um, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, snake oil salesmen out there, I would say, right. Proven. Ding, ding, here's ding. my proven method. Um, but also I don't want to be a total cynic about it because man, sometimes you <laughs> You run into a true believer with the right mindset, and it's just like, you know, well, how is this knucklehead so successful? And it goes back to, um, it goes back to smart. Smart's so overrated. Uh, you know, I was always told that, you know, I was smart. I got good SAT scores, um, but you know, smart doesn't mean. I think Adam Carolla has a pretty good quote about this. Like, you know, smart means that you know who you are and you're doing what you want to do. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, if you can do Vedic math or uh, read a book really fast. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that I'll say about smart. And I'm reading this book right now called mindset, actually, you know, having a, a fixed mindset versus a flexible mindset. And, um, you know, old Sarge, who was a, a dumb guy at 17, Shit, who wasn't? Oh, darn, who wasn't? Um, <laughs> um, you know, we all we all were dumb at seventeen. Um, so, uh, you know, just Warner and I were dumb at twenty-seven. Yeah. We were dumb at thirty-seven. Uh, yeah, I was dumb at thirty-five, forgetting the rules. But um, you know, um, I, I think that if you have a growth mindset, there, um, just hung, hungry beats smart almost every time. Um, if you're if you're playing the long game. Yeah, and to add to what you're saying, there's a book, as, as Mario knows, I have a plentiful amount of books on my Kindle called Barking Up the Wrong Tree. And this, this individual, the author, he reviewed the, the different successful people. And what he found was is the individuals that kind of grew up in these really systematized systems, like, I don't know, let's say you go to school, then you go to the Marine Corps, then you go to corporate America. They're really good at following the rules. But the guys like Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, that you know, some of those guys dropped out of high school or college they were really good at saying no and and they weren't really good in these corporate systems. It was a completely different mindset. It was these types of guys that changed and transformed the world because most of the world, 90% is in this box doing what everyone tells them to do. And then there's like 5% that are like, don't tell me what to do, dog. I'm, I'm going, I'm going that way. Hey, there's a tree in front of you. I don't care. I'll take that tree down. No, 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 you're not going to take it down. Yes. I'm going to take it down. No, no, no. You're not going to take I don't think you heard me. I'm taking that tree down, right? And it's those types of individuals that shape the world. So what you're pointing at is 
instead of like worrying about how smart you are, just go execute. It's what Mario and I are doing this podcast. Is it easy? No. Are we going to get into the metrics of the podcast? No, because I promised I wouldn't for a year. <laughs> but yeah, so Jocelyn, for what you're what you're talking about, so what's the next step? You're you're thinking about this this franchise. Have you taken it any farther than that? You're getting your house in order. What what are your next steps? Yeah, so uh, you know, personal finance is part of it. Uh, time preference is another part of it, which I believe is something you guys are are going into. Um, for some of the specific franchises I'm looking into, um, here by the way, let me, let me back up another time. Uh, one of the core skills of the MBA is how to read the three financial statements. I'm sure there's YouTubers all about that stuff, right? But you know, there's there's things called franchise disclosure documents, and um, this is all kind of new to me and it's fresh in my memory. But in those, they have um, you know sample statement of cash flows and and the like. And uh, so I went through there and and I calculated the break even point for this. And one of them, which was really cool right but absolutely crushed by the lockdowns uh you know taking that into account even still just like okay here's i'm doing the math here i know this is the type of place that um most of the crowds are going to come on the weekends i have to figure out a way to get bodies there during the week it's x number of customers a week optimistically my break even here is three years now there'll be cash flows there'll be revenues right i'm not going to starve um but you know it's it's kind of like a sobering experience then you look at the franchise fees and are those negotiable i hope so right you look at you know oh i have to rent my own building right and that's it's not just ebitda it's ebitda uh which i it's the first time i'd seen it in this disclosure document just like better better hope my rent's cheap right so um, yeah, um, so lot, lots of what I would say qualifiers and, and flags and, you know, you talk about being voracious readers and I think you can also be a, a voracious researcher of things like this. Um, cause, cause then you'll know how to really qualify the right opportunity when it comes up. Right. And second, second nature oh crap like look at look at their balance sheet run it through you know run it through my little calculator here and oh this seems like something that would be profitable for me and i'm in a right position to buy the business yeah you're doing the right thing you're you're doing exactly what you should be doing when you're looking at a private business or a public business or any type of businesses is calculate well what are the cash flows how much cash if if i own this entire business what are my cash flows and how long would it take me to get paid back what's my breaking point that's exactly how you should buy a fourplex. I mean, you think of the simplest business you could do. It's a fourplex. It's four units that you're going to rent out. When do I get paid back? If I buy all this, whether I use debt or not, if I buy this fourplex, when do I get paid back? And how much am I paying in relation to those rents? How many years of rents? Uh, Warren and I, one of our favorite equations is enterprise value divided by operating income. So that would be like EBIT or, or earnings before interest and tax, operating income, not, not net income. So if I buy the entire business, I pay all the debt, I pay all the equity, I pay all the preferred equity, I, I get, I get, I own the entire business. How long if I get the cash flows? Like let's say let's take a five-year average operating income. So let's let's kind of smooth out the business cycle over five years. How much am I paying in relation to that entire enterprise value? And, and look at all these businesses, and then then break it down by: Is this a fifteen percent operating margin? Is this a twenty percent operating margin business? Is this a thirty percent operating margin business? Because then you could pay a little bit more, going, ah, but this is a, this is a little bit better business than a laundry mat down the street, or you know, mom and pop down the street that are selling a laundry mat. I can actually go to the public markets and buy a better business. Yeah, I'm not in charge, but it's a better business. So you're, you're thinking the distance when you're looking at all these businesses and, and looking at what's your payback time. Um, I would ask you about your personal debt. So not to bring up a, a sore subject here, but you're 438,000, I think, if you don't have any car payments, if my math's correct. So in relation to your, let's say your take-home income, your W-2, you're a little bit over 100%. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and I actually watched uh, your video on that the other day, um, which... Um, you know, we're getting there. Um, it's just 
you know, the, the timing was too good not to uh, have a little bit of belt tightening right now, I would say. Um, would you be more confident or less confident if you, if you, if you knock that down to let's say a hundred percent, uh, would you be more confident or less confident to start that side of us or a transition out of corporate America? Absolutely. Um, and the other thing, you know, that we talk about time preference, right. Um, you know, my wife has a master's degree in reading, writing and literacy. Uh, but I have a, a three month old and a two year old right now. And, um, man, it's just, she's such a good mom, right? And it's far better for her to be at home with the kids. So, um, you know, it's not the, it's not the utmost of fiscal discipline right now, but um, it's part of being, being married, right? One of the questions I actually had for, for you, Mario, when you're just like, man, don't get into this mortgage, right? Mortgage is the death grip, right? And Latin for death grip. And, you know, you're working for the bank. Um, but at the same time, like, <laughs> I'm also working for my wifey, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, every, everything has a balance. Um, anyway, that that's all, all that being said, um, you know, when she goes back to work and, and probably uh, three years, um, get that sweet teacher insurance, right? Um, then I would feel very, very comfortable uh, setting out. Um, and it depends kind of on what my career trajectory is here, right? I, I think, you know, there's there's lots of opportunities to be entrepreneurial within an institution. Oh, sales is sales is the most entrepreneur thing you can do at SAP or any. I mean, I have a buddy who worked at, he worked at Pfizer in sales. He said the sales training that they gave me is is you can you can go anywhere with it. They can't take that back from you. When you leave Pfizer, they can't go. Hey, give us hey hey give us that training back we gave you that million dollars of sales training. Give us that back. No, 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 that's in my brain now. I'm leaving that with this knowledge. It's it's world class sales knowledge. And you're right. If you're going to go into any business. And you're in the sales department. There's two things you can't you can't run a business without two things. Everybody else can get fired. The last two uh, uh, units in the business is operations and sales. The business does not work without operations and sales. And the most the most entrepreneurial of those two divisions is sales. And if you're, I, I saw these guys uh, that work downtown Chicago in a very very corporate. Uh, structure and they had um, ponytails. They were bald guys with ponytails and it was not okay to have a ponytail. It was not okay to have a ponytail at this company. And I asked a friend, I said, how do those guys get away? You know, these are suits. These are suit and tie guys, you know, kind of beards, ponytail. I said, how do they get away with that? And they go, oh, they're all sales guys. I said, well, don't the rules apply to them? And they are not really. When you're hitting a million dollars, $10 million, $50 million, $100 million of sales every year, just leave them alone. He likes his ponytail. Just leave them alone. That, that's the beauty of results. You're in a you're in a division that you have results that you can show. Like you you have physical results that you could or, or, or monetary results that you can show. Like you could kind of there's there's a lot of boundaries that you can push. I'm not I'm not saying to be that guy, but if your results at the end of the month, end of the quarter, end of the year are that good, people are just like just leave them alone. He likes a ponytail. Just leave let him let him rock that ponytail. Well, business in the front, party in the back, right? So good for those bros. I don't want to discourage people to have a nice house. I think I love homes. Homes are beautiful. Architecture is beautiful. I've just lived so low to the ground for so long in third world countries that living in my truck on a beach in Hawaii is an upgrade. Being a home, being a homeless man in the back of my truck in Hawaii is actually above the ground. I'm not actually on the ground. I'm slightly above the ground. It doesn't work for everybody. I'm a single dude. It does. I've never been married, no kids. It doesn't work for everybody. I get that, but that is the thing. That is the th number one thing that's holding young men back or, or 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 dudes back in life. It's their mortgage. That's the big, the four hundred k. You wipe out the four hundred k, everything. Gets oh yeah, yeah. And and one of the things that um, struck me from from that talk I listened to, uh, Mario, was um, uh, you know, house is not appreciating. And uh, I was a rare case for that. Wasn't the case, right? We bought. Again, this was calculated, but um, kind of a pioneer neighborhood in, in South Philly um, that was up and coming, um, pretty close to some Section 8 housing, but, you know, it was safe. Uh, it was in, you know, South Philly is a little bit different than North Philly. Um, and, uh, yeah, be, because of the sale of that home, we were able to pay down um, 
the balance of my wife's student loan debt and uh, you know finance the down payment for this this mortgage here. Um, so I I know that there is an end game with that, right? Based on pure raw statistics, right? Blunt force of reality. Houses can't just appreciate in value forever, and it's by and large tied to inflation, which um, I don't know. It's going to go bananas pretty soon <laughs> if I'm going to stick my finger in the air. Yeah, and here, here's the challenge because I've been doing real estate. My dad started his own real estate company, so I've been around it ever since I was a little kid, as Mara you know, could tell you. So I know location, location, location. And then for the past 10 years, I was doing construction asset management. So I know those really well with my wife and we were building this portfolio. And what people don't understand about real estate is they're like, I'm just going to invest in this house and it's going to go up, up, up. But you just said the key to it, which is understand the thing about real estate that's different than anything else. And it's applicable to small local businesses. People treat real estate as this national thing. It's not, it's local. So that one neighborhood you're in, that had, you know, low income housing. Well, now there's a huge push because of the incentives from the government to go low income housing. If you look at a lot of investment money, it's going towards low income. So that's like a movement that way. But if you pick in like, like say outside, let's just say outside of uh, Yale University, I know someone, they're underwater for the past 10 years. So it, it's like any asset, it's really under where Mario and I are going with our podcast is really anything you're investing in, understanding the underlying value of it and really thinking it's a decision. Do I put my money here or can I put it here and grow it faster? So in 20 or 30 years, I can take that cash and buy a house for cash. That's what we're really saying. Warner's probably going to have to edit this out, but I'm going I'm to lay it out for the young nephews out there. This is how... This is how to do it, gentlemen. Okay, you follow the artists into the neighborhood. Wherever the artists move, they're, they're one, they know how to make things more beautiful. Okay, so follow the artists in the neighborhood. They like cheap rent and they know how to make things better. The next people to move in are the gays. They follow the artists. After the gays move in, the coffee shops show up. Okay, the last thing is when you sell. So you're buying, you're buying right around where the gays or the coffee shops show up. When the, when the girls in yoga pants show up with their yoga, yoga mats, and they're walking around the neighborhood. It's safe. It's gentrified. You've got artists, other people that follow artists, coffee shops, and then you've got the yoga studios open up. That's when you sell. That's where you're going to make the most amount of money. And, and, I, and I'll give you an on-the-ground example, multiple in Los Angeles. Arts District in LA. I got to LA in 2011. Arts District was back in the east side of LA. I don't know if Mario's been there, but it's like all warehouses. And it's and when you first saw in 2011, you're like, this is crazy. It could be a scene out of like a Terminator movie, right? <laughs> out, out in parts of, out of East LA, right? It, it's, just, it's just nuts. LA is just like that. So you had the artists coming in and taking over these lofts. And what you saw was what Mario was talking about. Uh, to add to what Mario was saying, there's also developers that come in. Mario was talking about more of a, a small neighborhood, but when you're in a bigger, more industrial area, you'll have you'll also see developers coming in with the artists. That'll be another key sign. As they started coming in, they start gentrifying the neighborhood. Then the yoga pants come in. The artists are getting pushed out. They're looking for like they're looking for like the other neighborhoods in LA, like Eagle Rock, or maybe they're coming towards Mid City. They're looking for like the tr the trendy. The undercurrent is kind of rough, but they can come in and get cheap rent and turn it around. But Mars is exactly right. The artists have an eye for seeing areas, and they'll come in and hit it first. The developers and, yeah, the gays will come in, and they'll elevate it. Well, the, 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 the gay men... The gay men don't have children, so they have a lot of... Design. They're really good at design. They Phenomenal they design. Buy. They the, they're really good at that. I'm, I'm not. I'm not discouraging. I'm, I'm. I'm not. I'm just saying this is the fact, gentlemen. Is that they, those guys that are in that community don't have kids, and they have money, and they know how to make it. They know how to bring everything up, and they follow the artists. They buy stuff from the artists. They make. They, they make their houses beautiful. Uh, so they know how. They follow the artists. They have money. They bring the neighborhood up. The coffee shop opens up. The, the entrepreneurs come in. They open the yoga studio up, and then you have young women moving. Exactly. In the yoga that's when they sell. develop. That's when it gets saturated, and you're at this this point where it's like if you're going to buy something in that neighborhood, you're overpaying for it. Um, but you just come up with that the AGCM model, right? It's the the artists, <laughs> coffee shops, milfs, and then the uh, 
you know, that's a whole cycle. Um, but see, the MILFs aren't looking for the artist salary. So, you know, they're not your value buyers. I, I can never be a politician. I'm, I'm, my, pol- my political career has just been smoked. I, I'm, I'm just a capitalist. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a shrewd capitalist. All right, Warner, take us, take us in a direction. Where do you want to go from here? Okay, so Johnson, we have about nine minutes left. What are your next course of actions for the next year or two to set yourself up for success so you can go create that that business, because you said you had that entrepreneurial spirit, it's kind of a, it's kind of attacking you or it's coming up in you. How are you going to foster that? So it's not just words, it's actually in a year from now, you're farther ahead. Because what a lot of guys and gals will do is they'll say, I want this. If they don't take the actions to fulfill on it, and they're in the same spot they were a year ago, and you watch the go-getters, they're executing and, and building bigger, bigger, bigger. How are you going to do that? So one is the accrual of capital, right? Um, startup capital, and then finding some creative ways to um, get it funded, right? Because it's not just, you know, entrepreneurs don't always just run out there and put themselves entirely at risk and set up an LLC. Um, they'll get seed money. Um, you know, I would even say that some of the things I'm interested in, I would feel very comfortable calling a friend from my MBA network and just saying, look, um, I can give you basically a, you know, 10% coupon for three years. Um, you know, can I borrow 10 grand <laughs> or something like that? Right. Um, I have a, a really excellent member of my cohort. Uh, I, I won't name him, but you guys should consider interviewing him. Um, he uh, won this thing at our, our uh, MBA program called be your own boss bowl. Um, and, uh, he's an asthmatic, and he came up with a wearable device for asthma monitoring, and uh, he's going places with it, right? He's the CEO of his own small startup, and um, yeah, I mean, he's been dining out on that since and is basically you know, poised to sell it to a, a much larger uh, medical technology company. Um, so talking to guys like that about, okay... <laughs> Tell me how you didn't just entirely bootstrap this, right? You, there's some trip, ticks and trip. Oh my gosh, guys. Tricks tips and tips. and tactics. Yeah, there we go. Or tricks and um, tips. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll uh, keep in mind as a model is, is timing talent territory. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure right now uh, is – the absolute best time to fly into a entrepreneurial vector for some things, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how distorted prices are right now. It certainly seems like they are. Um, and there are some places in the next years um, when the next um, economic correction happens um, that are going to be more successful than others, right? There's going to be winners and losers all over the country. Um and then, you know, talent, right? That's just the, the gray matter that uh, I continue to accrue, I hope. Uh, although some days having young kids, it, it feels like I am getting dumber. But, you know, smart's overrated. Smart's <laughs> overrated. <laughs> Mario, any, any other questions for him? I think I understand time. I definitely understand talent. Territory. Can you kind of unpack territory? Where in the country do you find do you where in the country would you be most comfortable investing your capital and, and investors capital to try to eke out a little profit yeah so um business friendly states right and there's there's basically the big four uh which are nevada texas florida new hampshire and the reason those are been business friendly is because there's no personal income tax um you know real estate and school tax those are all localized uh, but you know, across the board at, at those places, those are genu- uh, generally seen as good places to start a business, start a family, you know, build a legacy. Uh, I think Tennessee is one of those enclaves too. Um, although, you know, sometimes it's it's also about, you know, what you value and what sort of values you share with the community that's already there. I was just in, uh, <laughs> they let me out of my cage at work first time in 18 months, right? I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Customer uh, is a utility right there on the North Shore, uh, the the river's delta. Um, 
Pittsburgh Steelers stadium right there, concert venue, the baseball stadium. It's really cool. It's like Philadelphia, but not filthy. And, um, you know, just a really cool business and entertainment district there where it's just like, well, maybe I care less about what this costs and more about the upside, right? The margins, the cash flow, the Pittsburgh Steelers aren't going anywhere. Um, that utility isn't going anywhere. SAP has an office right there. The pirates aren't going anywhere, right? So um, you can kind of build uh, a, a symbiotic relationship with a brick and mortar business there. Um, so that's one thing that got the, the wheels turning. And that's just one example of, okay, here's a good territory, right? This neighborhood um, we talked about on the state level. Um, and then there's the third territory, which, you know, you guys are talking about assets, but another asset for your listeners can be an online business, right? And the costs of that can be extraordinarily low, right? Provided you have the right product and supply chain and all that stuff. Absolutely. Hey, before we land this plan, I want to ask you your book recommendations and I'll frame it around this. If you had to teach sales to someone through vicariously through three books, what would those three books be? How, how can you become a decent salesman with three books? So one we talked about before the, uh, the podcast, um, it's never split the difference, right? Chris Voss. Yeah. Chris Voss. Absolutely. Chris Voss is the man. Um, he actually came to our company. Um, yeah, he signed the book. That was pretty cool. Um, so def definitely that, just negotiating, empathizing, right? It, negotiating is not tricking the other person, right? It's making the other person feel heard and validated. And when you do that, you're actually, you can't fake it, is what I'm saying, right? You're actually building a real connection with that person. Um, the, the other... Um, book I would recommend. It's really short. It's called What the CEO Wants You to Know. Um, it's written by an Indian fella. I forget uh, his his name, but you know, four things in the book. Um, satisfy your customer needs, uh, cash generation, return on capital, growing profitably, right? And uh, all the other metrics and ratios involved in that. So that's a, a super good, very easy, plain English business primer. Um, and then you know, there's, there's kind of two, um, I'll give you four, four, four books total, right? Uh, the, the, the third one is to sell as human, right? And that basically means we're all in sales, regardless of what you're doing. Um, but this one I just read, I wrote a review on it. Um, maybe you could link to it in the show notes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, this, this book is called Indistractable. Uh, it's just about time management, right? Which is incredibly key for um you know running your enterprise um and it's also take stock of your values um cut out the stuff that doesn't matter and um you know diet the information you ingest um to, to stuff that's germane to your values excellent i appreciate those yeah go ahead warner yeah that's awesome and johnson one more thing before we end what or one other thing that mario would like to or we would like to leave with you which is when you're looking at these businesses, hit some per performance criteria. Like what's the operating margin you're looking for, right? How much are you willing to pay? What's your return on invested capital? And then one big thing we call the pandemic factor is how mobile is this business? Can your business travel? If, like tomorrow they come in or pivot and they say, we're shutting you down. Can you move? That's three things we'd like to leave with you. Uh, you provide us a lot of value in this podcast. We appreciate it. and. Uh, yeah, we'd love to. We'd love to talk to you more in the future as you, as you go down this journey. Man, I would love to do a check in in a year. That's that would be great, fellas. Awesome. Yeah. Last thing on that pandemic factor, I would say that if you're in the right business, like a utility, or if you go into a, the right space, the government goes, "I don't want to shut you down because people lose their power," and, and that gets that gets everybody upset. So if it, if it's not mobile, it better be something that the government says, we don't want to upset people. So we're not going to shut your business down. But um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and spending some, been, spend an hour, an hour and a half uh, dealing with these two knuckleheads on this, on this side. So uh, we send you our blessings out there on the East coast and we look forward to having you back in a year. Yeah, really appreciate it guys. It's, it's been a total riot. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We invite you to get to know us by clicking on our LinkedIn profiles in the description of this video. Please subscribe, 
hit the bell notification for future updates and share this content with your networks. Thank you for your valuable time and insights. We greatly appreciate it. 